Diderot begins his criticism of Duhamel's painting of justice with a general description of the work's pictorial contents. After offering a point-by-point -point description of the painting's surface, Diderot begins his incisive critique. The overall effect of this painting hurts the eyes. Rather than the, quote, mixture of men, women, gods, goddesses, animals, wolves, sheep, snake, and unicorns found in Duhamel's painting, Diderot suggested foregoing allegory altogether, which he termed the resource of a poor and sterile mind, in favor of a more familiar subject, meaning one that might be found in the natural world. He reasoned that we can only praise or reprimand those subjects of which there is no actual model to be found in nature. For the philosopher, a painting that only evoked either compliments or criticism on the part of the viewer was not good art. Rather, the viewer should be made to feel the moral struggle contained within the picture frame. Indeed, Diderot considered the aesthetic and pedagogical stakes one and the same. Themis, the Greek symbol of divine justice, was a poor choice of subject because the common man shared no dimension of mutuality or interchange with the metaphysical realm she occupied. Beyond the fact that divine justice simply fell outside Diderot's materialism, its pictorial representation was inefficacious due to the viewer's inability to identify with the mythological figure in the painting, an obstacle that would prevent the absorption of the painter's viewer into the action of the work. The workers and clients of the courtroom in Rouen would thus remain detached, worried Diderot, kept outside the scenic space due to the insurmountable distance between themselves and Duhamel's overly theatrical figures. The viewer would remain unabsorbed, thus unimproved. After criticizing the triumph for imposing an image of justice, rather than creating a narrative world habitable by its spectator, Diderot explains how he would have gone about executing a commission destined for a courthouse. If I had to create a painting for a criminal courtroom, instead of inspiring a group of men already cruel through habit to become even more ferocious by showing them the hideous spectacle of monsters they were tasked to destroy, instead, I would have looked for a subject in the pages of history. If history did not offer me a fitting narrative, I would have looked deep into my imagination until I came up with something that called men to commiseration and doubt, something that would make them feel the weakness of man, the atrocity of capital punishment, and the price of a life. Diderot prescribed eschewing the essentialization of vice and virtue, counseling the artist to imagine instead the goings-on of the mundane courtroom, where judges grew dangerously apathetic as their duty required them to view their fellow man through a thick screen of logical categories and imperatives. To further abstract the magistrate from the lived experience of the courtroom through an iconic figuration of justice, risked accelerating the judge's descent toward inhumanity. Rather than sharpening the viewer's resolve to mete out judgment in obedience to categorical norms of justice, Diderot instead called for a tableau capable of generating feelings of mercy. To illustrate his point, Diderot offered a description of Apelli's calumny as a suitable substitute for Duramo's work. It should be noted that Diderot had not seen this painting, in fact no one had since none of the renowned Greek painters' work had survived, but a description of it was given in Lucian's dialogues, in which the author related a picture containing the ghastly female figure of calumny 
dragging by the hair toward a judge the figure of innocence, a horror-struck child desperately imploring the heavens for deliverance. Here I have inserted a reproduction of Sandro Botticelli's 1495 La Coluña di Apelli for the reader's consideration, as this painting most carefully reconstituted the disposition of the original as told by Lucian. The judge, rather than majestically occupying the center of the painting, was relegated to the extreme right of the frame and seen in shadowy profile. Duhamo's triumphant and celestial justice was replaced by a very human substitute whose ability to transcend evil was entirely improbable. We see him there sitting, passively listening out of donkey ears to the lies of beautiful conspirators. Calumny disguised its innocence and her defenseless victim occupied the central space that Du Rameau had reserved for Lady Justice. Vile iniquity had usurped the throne of righteousness. The viewer, caught in this pre-adjudication suspense, feels justice slipping away. Diderot's apathy regarding the potential of mythological figures to intervene in the moral lives of his fellow Frenchmen corresponds to the shift during the Enlightenment away from the use of traditional mythologies toward the sacralization of man. I think Professor Jean Starobensky best described the shift in the following terms. Everything that had been considered sacred at the beginning of the 18th century, written revelation, tradition, dogma, had come under critique, a process of demystification that reduced the sacred to the level of human product, a fabulous product of the imagination. This meant the sacred was reduced to a psychological function, which also meant that certain human faculties were ascribed a sacred function. In the intellectual history of the century, the sacralization of the myth is closely linked to the humanization of the sacred. It might be interesting to contrast this era to Louis XIV's use of myth to further sacralize himself in the public imagination, whereas during the 18th century, the category of the sacred was left quite open due to nearly a century of material philosophical explanations that in certain ways displaced the social role of the Catholic Church. In this vacuum, the sacred then received a new content, the individual human, sense-based experience, out of which a new myth, the inviolability of man, would be born. Thus we see Diderot, perhaps the greatest of the French materialists, quite chagrined before the prospect of a purely mythological telling of justice. No human is in danger in Duhamel's painting, only ideals. And ideals meant precious little to the Enlightenment philosophers, who suspected them more often than not for being the reason for which men and women were suspicious of each other and allowed their natural curiosities to be stultified. Diderot preferred a painting that would remind everyone of the fallibility of man and their separation from any objective standard that might allow them to cast perfect judgment on their fellow man. And thus the need to look with clear eyes and read the hearts of every individual with whom one comes into contact. 